and they take Samantha, can you read for us today? Are you able to? I bother you. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you, Sister Mel. <clears throat> Let me see. Sister Sharon, can you can you pray for us uh, when yeah. a couple of minutes yeah. or so? Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Sister Sharon. Okay, we're just waiting another minute or so. Uh, in the meantime, I want to welcome everyone to the Open Arms Seventh Day Baptist Church Bible Study. We're studying the life of Abraham. We are in chapter 21 this morning. We are at about verse 11 of chapter 21. <clears throat> and we're probably going to read down to, down to verse 20. Yeah, we'll read down to verse 20. Uh, as a first uh, block of, of text that we'll be looking at. <clears throat> but let me welcome everyone again to the Open Arms Bible study. And we are in the, we're studying the life of Abraham. We started in Genesis chapter 11. We're up to Genesis chapter 21. Uh, we're at about verse 12 or so. Uh, verse 11, and that's where we're going to pick up our discussion this morning. But before we proceed any further, I will ask Sister Sharon Wilson, Deaconess Wilson, to say the opening prayer for us this morning. Bless the Lord. Father, we thank you for yet another day's opportunity to study your word. Your word, Lord, which is quick, which is powerful which is sharp and which has the ability, Lord, to pierce our hearts and to create a lasting change. So God, as we engage, Lord, with what uh, the, the, the word for today, we pray for, Lord, a discerning spirit. We pray, God, for clarity. We pray for revelation. And we pray, Lord, that for all of us, our hearts will be receptive to what you have to say to us, Lord, because your word will certainly not return to your void, but it will accomplish that for which it is sent. And so, Father, we pray that uh, you, that work will be accomplished in our hearts today. Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen your servant, brother, you, or teacher. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to anoint him and that you will fill him with all wisdom and knowledge. Oh, God, that comes from you and only you. So, speak, Lord, for as your servants, we are listening and we are, are declaring, Lord, that we will not only listen, but we will be doers of the word because that is most important. So we thank you, Lord God, and we pray that you will just continue to speak into your servant's heart and that you will empower him to deliver as you have ordained, Lord. We thank you and we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sister Wilson, thank you very much for really expressing <clears throat> the sentiments of all of us on the line this morning but with what we'd really have the Lord do for us as we go to his word this morning. I thank you very much for, for that prayer. Yes, we are studying the life of Abraham. We are in chapter 21 and Abraham's life, you know, lots of ups and downs and challenges just popping up. There's a little gap between them, maybe 10 years, sometimes 13, but highs, lows. And in chapter 21, Abraham faces another very testing situation here, very wrenching decision has to be made. Uh, from the very outset, back in chapter 12, God made this covenant with Abraham, this promise, promise him a land, a seed. Abraham would be a blessing. He'd be the father of nations. His name would be great. And some of those things are really taking place. And Abraham is now a famous man. 
you know, he's even engaged in have some military uh, adventures and God gave him the victory. He is able to resist certain temptations from people like the king of Sodom. His nephew Lot saw that he took advantage of his good nature and uh, made a choice that really should have been Abraham's. But we know he's also blessed by that priest king Melchizedek, very mysterious type person in chapter 14. But that the matter of a seed of a son continues to, to really plague Abraham. It's not happening. His wife, we're told at the very outset, was barren. But by the time we come to chapter 21 here, a seed is born. He has a son and everything is looking good. Uh, he had a previous son, uh, and that son Ishmael came by an arrangement, a suggestion from his wife Sarah, who was unable to bear him a son. That why don't we use the surrogate mother here to get that descendant? And it appeared up to this point that everyone had sort of accepted that Ishmael would be that person. But of course, there's some unease and the clan and some disquiet because there are now two wives. Mark, you one is the official wife and then the secondary wife has the son. And we can imagine the sort of things that would naturally flow out of that situation. But from the record we have, it appears things have been relatively quiet until we get to chapter 21 and now the son is born, the real, son of Abraham and Sarah. And Moses, the writer, really emphasizes that and emphasizes the work of God, the divine intervention in allowing Sarah, a woman who was barren and well past childbearing age, to now have a child. She's nursing her child. She is happy and everything is good. But uh, they're heading for the rapids here and we saw that yesterday. In the last set of verses that we read, we are, it's time for Isaac. That's, that's the name of Sarah's son and Abraham's son, and that means laughter. And we fully understand why that name is, was so appropriate. The first time Sarah heard the news herself directly, she laughed. She was 90 and she said, sure, it is going to happen, right? And she laughed. But now laughter is right on her breast and she's praising God. And she makes a statement in verse seven, you know, and it, it sort of speaks to maybe the sort of burden that she bore all these years because it's 25 years since they entered the promised land. And in verse seven, just to go back for a moment here, I read verses six and seven together. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? And that I was just thinking about that. And it sort of suggests that people are probably saying to Abraham, yes, Abraham, your wife is beautiful, but how many children has she given you? I know Sarah is saying, yeah, they can't say that anymore. I have given him a son. You know, so very personal, very, very human type story here. And uh, truly, Moses, Moses would have us understand that this is the work of God. The child of promise must be by divine intervention. And this is the unfolding of God's plan of salvation. And immediately we see the foundation that salvation is going to be of God. And uh, Paul in, in Galatians and Romans uses this story and draws a spiritual lesson from it. He's saying, Ishmael represents the work of the flesh and Isaac, the work of promise. And that's where the salvation comes, not from works, but by faith in God. And Paul, as he spoke to the Galatians, who they were Christians, but some false teachers had come into Galatia and began telling these Christians that, it's very good that you believe in Jesus Christ, but you need to have, uh, you need to get circumcised to be fully 
in, in this salvation, you need circumcision as well. And Paul makes the point that circumcision and the grace of God cannot work. They cannot coexist. And he uses this example of Sarah saying, Ishmael must leave as a picture of what must happen in the Christian life. The Christian must understand that you are saved by the grace of God and works will follow salvation, but works do not lead to salvation. And this is a story that he points to as he makes a very convincing argument in the book of Galatians. But we're down to verse 11. And here, Abraham has just received the news where uh, Sarah noted there was a big party going on because uh, Ish Isaac was being weaned and it was a huge occasion. It was a milestone for that child and for his parents. And Abraham has this huge party, but while the, the festivities and the nice times and all that are happening, Sarah notices that Ishmael is mocking her son. And she sees beyond, she sees this, uh, this is a little bit more than sibling rivalry here. This is a little bit more than maybe Ishmael is just feeling a little bit down because Isaac is now taking his place. She sees something really sinister in his behavior. And we read in verse 10, therefore she said to Abraham, drive out this slave woman and her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And she, there's some urgency here as she speaks with Abraham. And we read in verse 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son Ishmael. And Abraham is really distressed here. And that word distress means, you know, he, he shattered. He can't believe this. And he's not going to go along with it because he had developed quite an attachment to his son Ishmael. And now Sarah is saying, drive, drive them out. They have to leave the house. That could be, that could spell their death, actually, because they live in pretty much semi-desert and who knows where they're going to go. But Abraham, Abraham is not taking this lightly. Abraham, he's just distressed. And I guess he's saying no. But that's, that sort of brings us to where we'll pick up our reading this morning at verse 12. But before we continue with our reading. Are there any, any, any comments with regard to maybe yesterday's discussion or questions or reminders, anything we want to be looking for this morning as we proceed? And this, this request on the part of Sarah, <laughs> it's actually helpful to Abraham, though he can't see it yet, because he now has two sons, but one has to go. And then next thing you know, he knows the next one will have to go. So how is that going to work? Well, we'll see when we get to chapter 22. But as long as Ishmael is around, maybe Abraham can part with Isaac or vice versa because he'll still have one. So, but God is really pruning Abraham here. You know, he's really divest in Abraham of some of these uh, crutches he has, some things he's been leaning on, he's going to have to totally and fully trust God. And that's the spiritual life. God is going to take his people through certain challenges, certain tests to really bring us to the place that he, where he wants us to be. And this is what's happening to Abraham here. The, the husband man is doing some pruning. And he faces a very difficult situation here. His wife, is Sarah, demands that Ishmael and his mother leave. But any thought, any question, I forgot I'd ask that before I ask Sister Melissa to read for us. Okay. Okay, Sister Mel, please read for us. And I'm asking everyone to follow along in your Bibles or your devices as... Sister Mel is going to read from verse 11 of Genesis 21 down to maybe verse 20. Yes, 11 to 20. Sister Mel, when you're ready. Okay, Father, yeah. It reads, 
And the king was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Agar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Agar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Agar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. Verse 21. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Amen. Amen. Sister Melissa, thank you very much for reading for us this morning. So we see here in verse 11 that Abraham, the matter distressed Abraham greatly. That's how my translation puts it, because of his son Ishmael. So... And you know, this again underlines a point we have made a number of times that the consequences of sin just keeps rolling on and rolling on. We just can't break the thing. So we don't do it anymore, but the repercussions still linger. By now, Ishmael is maybe 16 or thereabouts. Abraham is very attached to him, apparently. And we saw that later down in the verses we just read, Ishmael is the kind of son that fathers sought to gravitate to, very outdoors type. You know, he's a guy who would be the captain of the soccer team or the football team or what have you. He's that kind of kid. And his father is very caught up with him. And now comes Sarah's demand. They must go. Now, so Abraham is, you know, he's saying no to this. But God speaks to him in verse 12. And my translation says, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. So I don't know if there's a suggestion there that maybe, you know, she was just, she was more than just the mother to Ishmael, to Abraham. Whatever the situation was, God says, whatever Sarah tells you, Listen to her, for true Isaac, your descendant, shall be named. And the point God is making to you here, one of the points is, just look at what's really important here. It's the descendant that has the promise, and that is Isaac. Yes, you're personally attached to your son, but human love is going to have to give way to the divine initiative here. Yes, you're very attached, all of that, but it's Isaac. He's the one through whom the promise will come. He's the one, it's through his line that the entire world will be blessed. So do what Sarah tells you. I don't know how far that was to be taken, but particularly in this instance, Sarah is saying, Hagar and Ishmael must leave. And God tells Abraham, do what your wife says. And again, God gives him this promise. And of the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. And again, this underlines that personal relationship that God has with his people. He says, Abraham, I'm not just sending him away. He's your son. I know it. I know how you feel. 
I'm going to look after him, but he must go. Any thought, any comment here? And, you know, Bertrand, this, this is something, this, this, uh, what God says to Abram here, I think at some point, if not this very day, there's some application here for us in that there are probably things in our lives that to which we are very much attached, maybe good things. And those things really stand in the way of God's will in our lives. It could be a job. It could be even family members. But things are persons to which we are attached. And while on the, on the human level, it, it seems good, proper, and right, maybe clashes with the divine, with God's divine will in our lives. And we need to make that wrenching decision. We need to let it go. This is what Abraham was being called upon. Now he has Ishmael. He's very attached to him. You know, his heart is really linked up with Ishmael. Oh, am I going to get Ishmael go? But as Paul points out in Galatians, the son of promise and the son of the flesh cannot coexist together. One has to go. And the word, the word here to Abraham is drive out the slave woman. Paul in Galatians, Paul says, look, drive out this matter of works for salvation. It can't work by the grace of God. And this morning, whatever our situation or individual situations might be, maybe it's something we're aware of that we have been struggling with, that we know we need to do this thing, but there's that attachment. We need to snip that thing. We, we need to cut loose here. And that's what Abraham faced. Not an easy decision by any measure, but that's what that's how the word of God came to him. Mm -hmm. Any 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 thought, any comment? Brother Hugh, I'm just reminded of when Jesus says, Whoever will not hate father or mother for my sake is not worthy for the kingdom. And we know he's not speaking that you must have active hatred for anyone, but in the context that if we're not prepared to follow him, even if it will cost some relationships. And this was a crossroads for Abraham because clearly this was the son of his own body. And I think, you know, I, I, I agree with what you were saying about your bond woman, that maybe there's a suggestion there's a little bit more even with Hagar, like maybe some, some level of attachment towards the mother of his son. And because usually she's referred to, she was referred to before as Sarah's maid, you know, but now it's Abraham's bond woman. So I think there's some significance to that, but regardless, you know, I think that point is coming out through this that if we're not prepared, like we're all going to face these crossroads in our Christian experience where we're going to have a choice. We're going to either separate or cut off, you know, those things that those sins that so easily beset us or family ties or friendships or job aspirations, career aspirations, whatever it is that is conflicting with the will of God, we're going to face those decisions. And this is not the first time Abraham would face it or the last time, you know? So it's not like it's just going to be one time. It's going to be throughout our Christian experience where we're going to come at these crossroads and we're going to have to say, I would rather have Jesus than anything or anyone. And Abraham, obviously, he made the right choice in this situation. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, dear Sister Sheena. And maybe some of us might be facing a crossroad this very day, even this moment. But, uh, you know, when we read when we study the word of God, we are blessed. You know, there are things that we need to be reminded of. There are, th there are things that will come into focus as we study the word of God. Maybe there are some issues that we've been sort of ducking, some things we know we have to deal with, but we just don't want to deal with that just yet. We don't want to really face the realities, but things will only get worse if we're out of the, out of the will of God. And the sooner 
we divest ourselves of those things, the better things will be. And so it's going to be for Abraham. But the Lord speaks to Abraham, and this is his response here is going to be, you know, it's very commendable. And something we've noted with Abraham already, that he likes to obey immediately. You know, Isaac is born, he names him Isaac. On the eighth day, he is circumcised. Abraham, he likes immediate obedience. God likes that too. And I don't think I can really over, well, I just want to point out again, how considerate God is to Abraham, how he goes out of his way to assure Abraham, let the boy go. I'm going to look after him. He's going to be a good, he's going to be a great nation because he is your descendant. So God is considerate of Abraham's feeling in a very sympathetic way. And so we know that we have a great high priest, the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews tells us that he can sympathize with our situations, right? He's been there, he knows the feeling. And so it is, Abraham gets the word. And we see here in verse 14, that immediate obedience that is coming out to characterize him. We read, so Abraham got up early in the morning and took bread and a, and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, put, putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now this area, the wilderness of Beersheba, this is, this is semi-desert, if not outright desert. And once you're out there, if you don't have water, you're gonna run out of water. And then the next thing is death, maybe a slow death, dehydration, whatever form that's gonna take. But Abraham gets up early, and he gives her water, gives her some provisions, and she has to leave a clan. She has to leave the camp. So she leaves, and she's out there in the wilderness of Beersheba, and she's suffering. Any thoughts? Any questions? Okay. Um, Brother Hugh? Yes. Um, it's what I said, um, like, you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. And then, you know, you see what happened here. Because sometimes we are trying to help God, but God does not need any help from us in that sense, right? Saying that, okay, he promised us something, but then we are trying to fix it ourselves. And when we try to fix stuff, we make mess of stuff, right? So we see here, we are, you know, even though Sarah, she talked to Abraham, and send it, send him in to her um, handmaid. And that was in the next token, she's telling him to get rid of her, right? So we see what happened because if she didn't have, if she didn't say that, like, you know, send him in or try to fix things, this would not happen. I know it's in the will of God, you know, because God allowed it to happen. But, you know, but we as human, we tend to try to fix things and we cannot fix, we, when we try to fix things, we make mess of things yeah? when we try to fix things. Sister Karen, thank you very much. So we heard Sister Karen's comment about, and I think she uses the term that we are trying to help God out. You know, God, God can really take care of his own business very, very well. And when we try to help God, we have problems, we start, that's where the flesh comes in. And that's what we have to avoid as much as possible. So yes, this is Sharon, thank you very much. This is a Karen rather, thank you very much for your comment. And these are the kind of lessons we have to look at, you know, where we decide that, oh, I can't wait anymore. Um, yeah, oh, I've been praying too long now, I'm gonna do this. That's when problem comes, our problems come at that point where we decide that we are gonna bring about God's will in our way rather than in his way and his time. So Karen, thank you very much for your comment. Any other thought? Yes, Brother Hugh. Um, I was, I'm also seeing here that Abraham had to just trust God to fulfill his promise regarding Ishmael's life because obviously the provisions that he gave them wouldn't be sufficient to sustain him for his entire life. 
he could only give them a little bit of food for the journey. And he has no idea where they're going to go, what's going to happen, what's going to befall them. But he had the promise of God that he will be fine. I'm going to bless him. Princes are going to come from him. I will take care of him. So if, even though it might seem like, wow, how can I just leave my son like this and send him out like this? But now he had to look to God and just trust God because now he couldn't do anything to take care of Ishmael and protect him. He just had to trust God to take care of his son. And I see that application for us as parents today, you know, where especially as your children get older, they're going to be in situations that you're not there and you can't control what happens. But we just have to trust God and leave them in God's hands that God will take care of them. God will speak to them. God will protect them from some of these influences of the enemy. Amen. Amen. So, you know, just in line with what, with Sister Sheena's comment, we'll note that in verse 14, it says, so Abraham got up early in the morning. Now back in verse 11, we read that the matter distressed Abraham greatly. But now he gets up early the next morning to do what Sarah had said. And the difference, what happened in that intervening time there is God reminded Abraham of a promise. And Abraham acted on that promise. God says, Abraham, remember, I'm going to make a great nation of Ishmael because he's your descendant. It not, it's not even like a general, I usually look after sons when they leave home. No, because he's your descendant. So in a very personal way, God makes his promise to Abraham and that's all he need. Despite the 16 years where he had Ishmael, they were doing this and that together, they were so tight. He gets up early the next morning to send Ishmael away because of the promise God made to him. And just about every time we open the scriptures, you know, there is some promise there. There's some, a reminder of some promise that God has made to us. The question I think that faces us, are we going to believe God's promise? Are we going to act on the promises of God that he has made to us and which are re repeated all over the scriptures? And we're, we're just reading here now where God is with his people. So I think it's a matter of reassurance for us this morning to know that this is the God we have. We have promises. He's a keeper. He's a promise keeper. And we should get some assurance from that. And the way to respond to that is with obedience, even as we see in Abraham here. So he sends Hagar and Ishmael out. They have some water. There are some provisions that's, that's only going to last for so long and not very long, particularly in that kind of climate. So in verse 15, we're going to read verses 15 to 17 now, but any other thought or comment? Okay, so I'm reading verses 15 to 17. When the water and the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him about a bow shot away for she said, may I not see the boy die. And she sat opposite him and raised her voice and wept. God heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Now the last time the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar, he started the conversation with a couple of questions. You know, where are you coming from and where are you going? Now, what is the matter with you, Hagar? And uh, you almost want God to ask you a question if you're Hagar, because when he does, good things follow. But here she is, and we can just imagine the distress that, I mean, I'm not even sure we can even imagine that, but if, you know, he, he's dehydrated, he's, gonna, he's going to die. She's gonna die. She puts him under some, some little shade, some kind of brush that's out there in the desert. And am I gonna stay with him and watch him die? Am I gonna die before him? Can I actually bear to hear him cry? 
I, I, I'm assuming she could see him where he was, but she probably can't hear him crying because she couldn't stand to hear the, 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 the crying either and the suffering he was going through. But verse 17 says, God heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord came to Hagar from heaven. What is the matter with you? Do not fear. Why? For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is, where he's lying, where he's lying down. God sees him exactly where he is. It's not like I hear somebody crying, but I can't tell where he is. I don't know where the sound is coming from. God is letting Hagar know in a very particular way that I see him where he is. I know what the situation is. Do not fear. You know, and I don't know if Hagar recognized the voice. Probably she did. But I can just imagine how the tears just dried up immediately. So God's, God comes with that reassuring word, do not hear. Our God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Now, this is a very desperate situation. And God's intervention, as usual, comes at the right time. And I was just thinking about you know, the prayers that Abraham and Sarah might have put up to God over how many, 25 years. And it's 25 years later before the prayer is answered, but it comes at the right time as well. Now, Hagar is just praying right now, and the answer comes at the right time again. So God's time is right. Even if we don't know that he hears our cry, he does hear our cry, and he cures, and he knows the detail of every situation and every challenge that we face. And this is what Hagar is finding out right here. Earlier, Hagar described him as the God who sees. And that, again, is confirmed in, in these three verses we just read. Any thought, comment, uh, question? So God answers prayers in his time. We saw earlier as well where God said no to a particular prayer. So there's no, there's wait, maybe, yes. All of those are options for him. So the angel continues speaking here with Hagar, verses 18 to 20. I'm looking at, get up, lift up the boy and hold him by the hand, or I will make a great nation of him. Reassurance. He's not, he's not just going to live. God is going to make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. So the thinking is that the well maybe was there all along. In her grief, she didn't see it, you know. And we can't see the solutions that God has for us very often. We, but we need to trust him, and we need to keep praying. Because when we pray to God, you know, we are also saying that, Lord, I know you can do this. It is in your power to do this. Right? You're, you're not going to pray to somebody who can't do anything for you. So that's another purpose of prayer. It is to establish God's position relative to our position. When we pray, we're saying, God, we're down here and you're up there. You have the power. You can do something. That's why we're coming to you. But God answers his prayer. God heard God heard Hagar's cry, saw her tears, and he responded in the moment. Now she has water. They're alive. He saved their lives physically. And they're going to drink thirst quenched, and she's going to be on her way. Tell her comment. Brother Hugh, I find it interesting that God didn't appear the angel of the lord didn't appear to hagar on the outset of her journey when she still had provisions god it's almost as if god waited until the situation was hopeless seemingly hopeless i mean it was seemingly hopeless even from when you start out on the journey but God could have said, hey, I'm with you, Hagar. I'm going to provide for you. No worries. But 
it's at the time when you know Ishmael is distraught and and discouraged and crying and they're run out of their water and their provisions and Hagar's not worried and she doesn't know what to do that's when God steps in and says I'm here don't worry and I feel like you know sometimes God does work like that with us to stretch us and it's uncomfortable it's not pleasant and he will allow for us to run out of options and run out of earthly solutions and at that point when there is nothing else that we can do and we're just there in desperation crying out that's when god shows up and he says don't worry i'm actually here even if you felt like there was no hope at this point absolutely and and i think this has been there there have even been times when we have given up you know yesterday in the past i made a comment about how our prayers change over time as we wait there and god operates in so many different ways as you're saying your sister sheena sometimes he's there at the outset then it's when you've exhausted all your resources that he comes sometimes he's just with you when you're in the bottom of the pit and you're surviving because he's there with you and then he will lift you but god knows what's best for his people in every kind of circumstance and that's why you know we we trust him abraham knows they're going out in the wilderness they're going out in the desert actually he knows this water is only gonna last for maybe three hours or so and then what but he trusts god he trusts the promise of god so whether we are aware of when he's gonna come if he's gonna come we know he will do something and i find it interesting in verse 19 it says then god opened her eyes and uh sister sharon was praying this morning you know she was asking one of the requests was that God would really open her eyes to really see him and understand him in his word. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of a promise, you know, and this is why the, the word of God has to be close to us at all times. And you, you talk about the different ways that God, you know, does things to Sashina. And this is why it's such an, an error on our, on our part when we try to dictate to God as to, how I want this problem fixed. Yeah, and Lord, please do it this way. You know, <laughs> we need to leave those details to God, okay? Because he knows best and he comes at the time when they need him most. Hagar and Ishmael, I know they have water and they're good. God's promise stands. Any other thought or comment? Yeah, that's all right. Yes, uh, uh, oh, the noise in the background is not too much, but I just had to um, say something on that point, man. Um, I find even for myself, I'd like to dictate, as I said, and I expect a kind of result from the master. I don't get it a complaint. I, you know, since I see that something so important, you know, it's like in that. When, when you're all out, when you're desperate, and you don't have anywhere to turn, you're curled up and you think that you're going to have to die now, and then he comes in, at the nick, in the nick of time. And I find God does that so often, even for me, is when I've released my independence, and I'm not completely dependent, I don't have any other option, I don't have anywhere to turn. I don't have any avenues and literally between a rock and a hard place. And then he just comes through. And, and then afterwards, I say, oh, okay. Now I understand the plan. Post analysis, I can say I understand what you were doing. My prayer, though, is that for the next round of things, the next round of challenges, like, you know, I know God is working on a testimony in my life, you know, Sister Chris, and his life right now. And I'm just praying for the next one. I challenge is that I remember what he has done in the past. Yeah. And know that I know that you know he still has it on a country with the same God. I just have to just keep trusting that he has done before he can in the way that he decides. 
Hey Amen. By the way, thank you very much. And you know, by the way, it's probably out in the wind. That's why we're hearing those sounds. By the way, it's saying, and I, I think this is something that we've seen come up a number of times in our studies. You know, by the way, he just mentioned that he hopes the next time he can remember what God did for him, you know, and really go with that rather than, because the experiences that we have with God, the experiences that are recorded in the scriptures are there for learning and to remind us of things. And in our own lives, in our own experiences, we have seen how God has worked. We need to keep memory of those things. You know, they're like in the bank there for us. When, when the next challenge comes, we can recall what God has done. And again, we keep talking about the word remember. It's all over the scriptures. Remember what God has done. Remember who he is. Keep in mind what his promises are for us. Remember his faithfulness to his promises. Those things will really buttress us for the next challenge that comes or even the one that we are in presently. Yes, Brother Ray, thank you very much. And your prayer, dear sir, is the same as ours. We want to remember what God has done for us in the past, how faithful he is, so we can deal with the challenges as they come. Any other thought or comment? Okay, so they are refreshed here at the, at the end of verse 19. And I'm looking at verses 20 and 21, which sort of gives us a wrap on Ishmael's, uh, Ishmael's almost his life, it says, and God was with the boy and he grew and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Now, a couple of things here in verse 20, they didn't just survive. Okay, so they come out in the world, they were gonna die of thirst. They found a well, God showed her a well, they ate, they drank, they were okay. We read that God was with him and he grew. So we see here that God's promise to Abraham that I'm going to look after your son. God keeps his promise, you know, and this really speaks to God is not just good to the promised seed. He's not just good to Isaac. We read, for example, in Matthew 5, 45, it says, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send it rain on the just and on the unjust. God's common grace reaches all of his creation. God is good to all, not just his people. You know, everyone, once we wake up in the mornings, we are breathing the air that he provides. In all kinds of ways, God's goodness on mankind in general is evident whether people knows it or not, or whether people know it or not. But here we see he made a promise to Abraham with regard to Ishmael, and we see God keeps his promise, even to those who are not part of that, that blessing, part of that promise. So we note as well, <clears throat> and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. You know, so there's still some Egypt here in Hagar, and it goes right down to Ishmael. Uh, we're going to see that when it's time for, for Isaac to be married, Abraham goes to great length to ensure that he's not married to one of these Canaanite women. We note even further down in the grandchildren generation, Esau was a grief to his parents because of the, the Canaanite woman that he was associated with. So Hagar, she was Egyptian. She's still Egyptian. She came into the land, into the clan. She was under the canopy of Abraham there for a while, but she has a son and she gets a wife from Egypt for him. So yes, <clears throat> sometimes we, we, we have to just ensure that we don't go back to Egypt. Eventually Egypt becomes a figure for the place where God's people seek refuge rather than in him. And at different points, the prophet told the people, do not go down to Egypt. 
but this is what we see Hagar does here. But Ishmael is a child of promise. Any thought, any comment here? Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Paul really uses this episode here in Abraham's life as a picture of the spiritual life and the fact that believers need to understand that they have to separate themselves from certain things. They need to understand primarily starting out that salvation is of God and not their works. The promise did not come through the work of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. It was a divine act by God in his time. So that kind of closes the book there. Now, earlier in chapter 15, God, had, God told Abraham that, Abraham, I'm your shield. And at the time, there might have been some security concerns for Abraham. He just attacked some kings, some very powerful individuals, defeated them, rescued the people that they had taken captive. And there was always a threat of reprisals from these people. Maybe that's what was worrying Abraham. But God told him at the time that, Abraham, I am your shield. We're going to see that manifested in these last verses here in chapter 21 this morning. And I'm going to ask Sister Melissa if she's still available, if she'd read for us verse 22 to the end of the chapter. And we can follow along as Sister Mel reads if she is able to. Yes, brother. Thank you. It reads, at the time, Abimelech can recall the commander of his army said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servant had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs, of the flock apart and Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand that this may be the witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Verse 34, and Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Amen. 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 So here we see a little wrap here on, a, on, on this chapter of Abraham's life. But God takes care of Abraham on many different fronts. And in that part of the world, even to this very day, you know, wells are very, very important. If you don't know where water is, your life is in danger. But we see that Abimelech, and we met Abimelech a little earlier on, back in chapter 21, I think it was, or 20, Natural witch. So Abimelech and his chief of staff, his command in general, they visit Abraham. His name is Phicol, we see here. So they greet Abraham with, God is with you in all that you do. But isn't that, isn't, isn't that a wonderful thing for people to say about us though? For someone to actually see you and realize that God is with you. You know, to me, that, that's striking. And this is from a man who is a pagan. But this Abimelech, he'd ha he's had an experience already with Abraham, and he has a sense of who Abraham's God is, because we understand from that chapter, I can't remember which, maybe it was 19, 
that God had done something to Abimelech because Abraham had to pray for him and his entire clan, and they were healed. So Abimelech, he learned his lesson. He realized that Abraham is a powerful man here, clan leader. You know, he's on our borders. I, I need to be at peace with this man. I know who his God is and what his God can do. So he makes the first move, okay? So here is Abimelech acting on, the, on Abraham's God. He knows Abraham God to be this way. That means I need to be friends with this man. So he comes out to meet Abraham. He brings his general, of course, with him. And his proposal is, Abraham, look, uh, let's make a covenant. Let's live in peace. Okay, I know God is with you. And, you know, when I go, I want it continue between your people and my people. So Abraham, Abimelech is a wise individual. You know, he wants to be friend with God's people because he knows who Abraham's God is. When Abraham first went into Gerar and he heard about Abraham's wife, he saw Sarah. She's in his harem immediately. Now, <laughs> if he sees Sarah coming, he goes the other way because he knows Abraham's God, that Abraham's God is to be feared. So he comes and he wisely makes a, proposes a covenant of peace with Abraham. And of course, God told Abraham, I am your shield. So Abraham says, no problem. Abraham is a man of peace. Unless, of course, you, uh, you kidnap his nephew, then things will not go well. But here, Abraham says, not a problem. I'm a peaceful man. But then, you know, apparently Abimelech's people, his soldiers, his servants, whoever, had taken over one of Abraham's wells. Very important thing. People take your well. It's going to have a huge impact on your herds, on your flocks, maybe even on your life. Abraham says, well, well, what about, you want to make peace with me? What about my well that your, uh, your servants took? And, uh, you know, Abimelech pleads innocence here. You know, first time I'm hearing about who, who did what? But it's your well, Abraham, no problem. You, you keep the well, so it's yours. And so Abraham makes a covenant here, but he wants to do a little something to ensure that we did have this agreement so he set aside some animals here and that marked the fact that I dug this well. And Abimelech, Abimelech accepts and the well is, the, the covenant is, it's, it's ratified through this little act. Early on, remember where God ratified the covenant with Abraham and they went through a little ritual there where they cut animals in two. And it was typical and common that covenants are sealed through some kind of ritual. And this is what we read happening here with Abraham and Abimelech. So they named the place Beersheba, which, is, which means the well of the oat or the well of sevens. And the, the, the agreement is sealed. Now it says of Abraham in verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. He is another name for God, El Olam, the everlasting God. And Abraham resided in the land of the Philistines for many days. As we mentioned earlier, at this point, the Philistines have not yet become that formidable military force that they will later on and become a plague to the Israelites. There's just a small tribe of them that are in the land presently. But Abraham is at peace. God is his shield. Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. We know that worship characterized Abraham. He built altars wherever he went, and he called on the name of the Lord. And therein again is another marker in Abraham's life that we need to emulate. Because we, as we've noted a number of times, Abraham is a model for us in the fact that he lived the life of faith. And we see that this life of faith is up and down, but we are on a steady upward trajectory. We must never level off or go in the opposite direction. We see Abraham's faith here being built up again. God is faithful and Abraham is trying to follow along. So our time is up this morning and we're at the end of uh, chapter 21 as well. Any 
closing remark, comment, uh, question here? Yes, uh, Brother Hugh, just a quick comment, because uh, I think it's so pronounced in the ending of this of this chapter, and it is that if you are a child of God and people take advantage of you one way or the other, we must leave vengeance to God. And it's hard for me to say that because naturally we would typically want to defend ourselves. But I think this example with Abimelech shows the kind of God who is also our shield, where things may happen and we go ahead of God and try to fix it ourselves. Whereas if we prayerfully, because again, this is not a sort of passive response. This is, Father, you see what's happening. And I'm asking you to intervene. So you're aggressively praying for God to intervene, but you're not going ahead of God and, and handling matters in our own hands. Amen. Thank you very much, dear pastor, for that comment. So we wait on God, and the pastor said, as God said to Abraham, I am your shield. Pastor, are you able to pray for us today? Uh... Absolutely. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for this food for the soul at lunchtime, dear God. And we just ask that you continue to bless this ministry and bless all those who are a part of it. And Bless the one who's led us out, and we just continue to give you thanks and ask that you'll keep us as we're unable to keep ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. And again, I thank everyone for being with us today. Prayerfully, we are blessed by this daily reading of God's Word, and I invite you to join us again tomorrow, same time, and very happy that you're with us today. Have a pleasant afternoon. Thanks and same to you.